Welcome, everybody. Episode 38, live from my drum room with the one and only Kenny Aronoff. Um, just been catching up with Kenny for a couple of minutes. And uh, what is going on with my sound? Okay. <laughs> and, uh, oh, man, Kenny had me had me dying for a few minutes here. So, uh, you know, it's it's just a a sampling I know of what's about to come. So anyway, uh, thanks for tuning in today on this Friday. I came really close. I have to tell you, I came this close to uh, calling in sick today. It's about 72 degrees or 74 degrees and sunny here in Cohasset, Massachusetts today. And I live about a mile from the beach. So yeah, this is what happens when you book these things weeks in advance. You know, you never know really what the weather is going to be. And then when you get a day like this, you're like, why did I, why did I say I'd do this? I could be at the beach right now. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm as excited as you guys are watching this right now to be here. That's actually, I'm probably a little bit more excited because Kenny Aronoff is going to be on the show today. So anyway, a uh, couple of quick housekeeping uh, bits here. Welcome to episode 38 with Kenny Aronoff. Uh, I'm up to 829 YouTube subscribers as of this morning. Pretty fantastic, I know. And, and that number keeps growing, and I appreciate that, all you folks that have uh, subscribed. I also want to uh, mention the upcoming shows I have. Been uh, working to get a couple of guys. I've had no luck getting Charlie Drayton confirmed on a date. So, Charlie, if you're watching this, I, yes, I'm trying to make you feel guilty, and I hope it's working. But I'm happy to say that next Friday, the 21st of May, 1 p.m. Eastern time, my guest will be Steve Gadd. And uh, Steve's a, a fine young drummer. He's played in a few bands and uh, recorded a few records in his career. And uh, he's promoting a new book that's coming out soon called Gadiments. So I thought I'd give him a shot on the show to help him promote it, you know, give him a little, little boost. That's the kind of guy I am. I like to help these young up and comers and uh, Steve seems like a nice, nice young kid. And I think he's pro got a promising future. So that's next Friday, the 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Steve Gadd, that's right, Steve Gadd, I said it. And I'll say it again. Um, Let's see, let's see, let's see. Following that, the following Friday, the 28th of May, I have the great Jeremy Stacy, which I'm excited about. We've been talking uh, for some time about getting a date, so Jeremy will be on board. And upcoming shows, uh, dates to be confirmed will be, I mentioned Charlie Drayton. I will get Charlie on here eventually. Um, Dave Desenzo, uh, Mike Beard, and uh, Mike Mangini. Just some names to throw out there. Some drummers you may or may not heard of. I've heard of a few of them. All right, look at this. We got a few folks watching. This is great. <laughs> Bob Terry, I have a beach. Come on over. I'll be over, Bob. I have a pretty nice beach here too, and it's 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 small and manageable. So it's uh, it's a nice beach to uh, you know sort of spend time at without having to deal with a lot of nonsense, if you know what I mean. So, and I think you do. All right. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to tell you about. I think Kenny's going to really do all the talking today. I do want to mention this in case Kenny and I get sidetracked, but I'm, I plan to bring this up. Kenny wrote this book a couple of years ago. Actually, it's been more than a couple of years now. Sex, Drums, Rock and Roll. The Hardest Hitting Man in Show Business, Kenny Aronoff. This is a great book. In fact, I read this two years ago, 2019. So it's been out even longer than that, obviously. I saw him the summer of 2019 at Martha's Vineyard. He played with John Fogarty. I brought my book with me and he was nice enough to uh, personalize it for me, as they say. Uh, we've got quite a history, Kenny and I. All right, so thank you again, everybody, for watching today. It's a pleasure to see so many folks tuned in. Um, I'm gonna get right down to it. And without further ado, let me um, hang on one second. I want to be able to see your questions. Uh, without further ado, please welcome 
my good friend, the legendary, the one and only, hardest working man in show business himself, Kenny Aronoff. Hey, John, I'm not playing drums anymore. Bill Belichick just called me up and they, you know what? If Tom Brady can win the Super Bowl at 43, I can do it at 93. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can. You right? could. I'd, I'd put you out there, buddy. Absolutely. Dude, um, I just I just motivate everybody. First of all, I do is I motivate everybody. I just stack everybody on the line. So, you know, all the other 10 players would be on the line to <laughs> protect me. And then we just kind of move down the field like a like the Romans used to. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, if you get three yards of play, you're going to get a first down. And That's true, yeah. You, you could, yeah, you could just keep converting on little three to four yard little yeah. rushes or, or just little short passes and... yeah. Yeah. So I mean, see, already that that's my that's my one and only play. Well, I hope I hope Bill's watching right now, Coach Belichick, <laughs> because he's going to need some sort of plan this year. With uh, well, I don't know. We'll see. It remains to be. Well, seen. they got did they? Yeah, they just got it. They acquired a quarterback. Yes. Besides the 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 mistake they had last year. <laughs> yeah. So do you think? Do you think? Uh, can't think of his name. The mistake. Tom Brady. Brady. But no, Tom Brady. Um, oh, the oh, I, I space his name too. You mean the quarterback from last year? Yeah. I space. I space his name too. The guy used to play for Carolina. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know he's um, he's he's been hit so hard so many times that we can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next level. You know, you hit the guy so hard that the fans can't remember who he is. <laughs> Do you oh remember? God. I mean, when he played Denver in the Super Bowl, and I oh. mean, by halftime, that Cam smiley. Newton. Cam Newton. Cam Newton, Newton yeah. That smiley face was like, it was unbelievable. <laughs> hey, wake up, buddy. <laughs> oh, my God. I know. I know. Uh, hey, uh. Grace, AJ's wife, Grace, is watching, and she says hello, AJ. Altino. Oh yeah, from uh, uh, in Florida. From Tampa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Grace. Grace is all. Grace is always so cool. Grace, you rock. She's probably she still does. as beautiful as she always is. I, she is. She. I see pictures. She absolutely yeah. is. A lot of, lot of our friends are watching. Kenny, Bob, Terry. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, Bob, what's up? Bob Sidlowski. Uh, yep. Our old friend Jerry Dupree, who I know. Oh my God! I mean. yeah. Yeah. yeah, dude, I knew Jerry from Boston. I mean, the Boston, yeah. Indiana. Indiana, yeah, yeah. He said this morning that he's known you. I've known Jerry like forty plus years. Yeah, and and he said I've known Kenny longer than I've known you. So yeah. Yeah. Oh my God! Man. I was a nobody back then. No, no, you've always been a somebody. I've been a somebody yeah. to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> So, man, you know, I don't even, I, I, I didn't make any notes because. You don't have to. It's, yeah, it's Kenny Aronoff. It's like, yeah. I, it's, it's, there's so, I'm, I, 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 there's so much stuff to talk about, but I would just love to know, I'd love for you to tell people, like, just give them an idea of what you've been doing for the last year, like during this craziness when yeah. it's upended everything. Yeah, well, uh, well, first of all, I, I, you know, I have a, a motto that I, that I just recently gave a whole speech on. It's called Adapt or Die. It's that simple. Yeah. Adapt yeah. or Die. You have a choice. And uh, so, you know, when the pandemic hit, I lost a, you know, a whole a world tour with Joe Satriani. Uh, you know, we had, we came out with a record, came out num on the charts at number eight, and all of a sudden, Europe, South America, U.S. went. Fogarty went down. A, a thing I was going to do with Billy Gibbons went down. So I went, okay, no touring. Thank God I already had adapted when the record sales tanked way back when uh, the budgets tanked. And for those people who don't know, I had drums in Nashville, L.A., um, <clears throat> New York, Indiana, of course, where I was living. And I had even drums in uh, Germany and in Japan. And people would fly me even for one song all over mm -hmm. the world because there were budgets. And, you know, we're talking first class, uh, nice hotel, rental car, car service, per diem, all that went. So, and I was booked 
uh, you know, seven days a week for months. I mean, there was a period, it literally went like this. Uh, Monday, I'm in the studio with Bonnie Raitt and B.B. King for uh, a movie soundtrack. Tuesday and Wednesday, Elton John. Thursday through Sunday, Bob Seger. Then I flew from L.A. to Athens, Georgia, did the Indigo Girls, which is stylistically a whole different thing, very folksy. So I did that for a week. Flew back to L.A., did Willie Nelson for a day. Four more days with Seeger, and then two weeks with John Bon Jovi doing Blaze of Glory. Now, that's about a month. That was my life, mm -hmm. and that all went away. So I adapted by getting my own studio. And so when the pandemic hit, I thought, hmm, are people going to still want to spend money on music? Or are they going to say, hell with that, I got to eat. But music is such a positive thing and it makes people feel good mentally emotionally spiritually and in our case being drummers physically that people no no we i we want i want i'm this is my saving grace is to make music so that that didn't go away so uh so i already had that and uh and my studio is not in my house it's six miles away which is cool so mm -hmm. the driving to a studio you know, with mask and gloves and the whole thing and wiping everything down was like, like, oh my God, this was amazing. Yeah. And it was almost like being on tour and then coming home every night and I could be with my wife, which was like rare that I ever did that for the last 40 years. So, um, okay, that was one thing. Then I lost all my speaking engagements for the people who don't know. I have a I do motivational speaking. I have an agent and, you know, I have a whole teamwork, innovation, uh, you know, uh, stay relevant, adapt or die. You can't mm -hmm. set it and forget it. Uh, and then realizing your purpose in life. And I can talk a little bit more about that. But suddenly that went down. So I went down. Okay. Long and short of it, I invested in equipment and I turned my recording studio into a TV studio where I could do uh you know virtual speaking my game my my business model was get this up and running and get it all tweaked out i mean we're dealing with pro tools and i have two cameras one on a speaking location and one on a drum set location mm -hmm. but i have backing tracks that are in a, another computer that go into a mixer then i have the pro tools all my mics on my drums going into my main studio then I, that goes back into the mixer headset into the mixer i have a, another computer that runs my deck with a soundtrack that goes in my mixer that all has to be mixed just right goes mm -hmm. into an analog to digital converter bam into zoom which zoom sucks pretty much it's like they still are not up to date with latency and stuff then i had the whole visual component going into zoom anyway i got that up and running and i did get i beat my my goal which was to be up and running so i could do virtual speaking in 2021 but i i did start at the end of 2020 i got a speech then i got another one in january and i just did one a month ago and now you know, the whole thing was up and running. And so that plus doing my audio book, plus a drum book with Hal Leonard, with Rick Mattingly, which is a, a play along, which is a, turned into a huge project because I'm trying to emulate different styles of music. So I'm playing everything from like, you know, Midnight Rider by the Almond Brothers to Pride and Joy with Stevie Ray Vaughan. And I'm trying to play yeah. authentically, which means I'm practicing technique so that I can sound and not just this crash bash style of playing that I'm known for, but to play the Texas Shuffle, I spent two weeks on it. And I did like Maiden mm -hmm. Voyage by Herbie yeah. Hancock. That's yeah. a whole different. Wow. And oh, I, I, yeah, I crossed over yeah. uh, into all kinds. I did uh, another jazz thing. Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, you know, Sarah Vaughn, Ella Fitzgerald used to sing all the time. Um, I'm spacing it up. But. You know, anyway, that turned into a, a very, very... To, see, you know, everything That's Kenny it. does is authentic. I got to be authentic. So anyway, that book, and then there's uh, Modern Drummers doing a legend series and doing one on me, and yeah. it's like 19 transcriptions of all these different songs. And then I, I uh, with uh, <clears throat> with Mark Griffin, we, uh, uh, you know, I had to have 19 stories that went with each one. And it goes on and on. I got so many projects. Now it's like the live stuff's coming back. Oh, I did another Joe Satriani record in my studio. He said, well, can't tour. Let's make another record. Sure. But but yeah. because I have my studio, 
Long and short of it, Kenny has been busy. <laughs> Kenny has, so let me, and <clears throat> two quick things. Uh, Candy Vermonti is watching and says hi. Our dear Candy, how you doing? And she always said, Candy, she always said, she'll text me and go, hey, hey, do you know any good drummers I can call? <laughs> Candy, there's five fingers coming at you. I love her. Candy's the best. Bam. She's like her dad. Her dad has that same sense of humor, you know? Well, I'll kick both their asses when I see you next. <laughs> and also, Neil Porter, <clears throat> who's in my band, Grand Theft Audio. Oh, like, awesome. He's watching. He loves you. He's been talking about this for two weeks, Kenny. I swear to God, he's really? Neil's probably texted me three different times and asked, when is Kenny? What time? And he's working right now and he's watching. <laughs> so well, I tell, tell Neil... Him. Tell Neil to text the questions. I mean, if he's that big of a fan, ask okay. me a question. He said, he just, here's what he said. Kenny, I love your work with, I love your work, caught you with Fogarty and at the Fox at uh, All My Friends Show for Greg Allman. Oh, my God. He talks about that. Neil, that's, that, that show was, was huge. That was amazing. First of all, me on stage with the Allman Brothers, me on stage with Greg Allman, and all these other iconic artists. That's the beauty of these. These. I mean, I'm the most viewed guy on Access TV. Literally, they call me I, <laughs> Mark. I, know. I mean, I'm on all these specials, but I get to play with like 20, 25 artists when I do them. So it's, and so yeah, dude, Neil, that was what that was an extraordinary show, and playing yeah, with. Yeah. And one of the greatest songs was Midnight Rider, with uh, uh, Greg Allman, of course. Zach Brown, who's got the most powerful voice and soulful, and then uh, Vince Gill. I mean, you guys got to oh, check yeah. it out. And yeah. the singing is amazing, but when you see Vince Gill solo, I mean, even Zach and Greg looked over at him like, I mean, the guy is so authentic. He's, it he's was, a monster he, player. He's a monster. Yeah. Anyway, thanks, Neil. That was an extraordinary show. That's cool. Well, so let me let me jump back one second, and, and I want to keep talking about this stuff, too. When you said you're doing 19, you're doing the, the Legends series for Modern Drummer and 19 songs, you know, some people may think that's a lot of songs, but that's like a drop Nothing. in the bucket. How do you pick, how did you pick, how did you come up with 19? Did you get to pick oh, yeah. them or did MD pick them or? Well, MD started with, and by the way, people listening, I mean, I've, I'm on like 300 million songs uh, sold. <laughs> I mean, some yeah. of the records I played on were 40 million, like uh, two Celine Dion records sold 40 million each, and then Meatloaf, Bat Out of Hell too, with I'll Do Anything for Love, But I Won't Do That. Then Ricky Martin with Shake Your Bon Bon, which was to the, they made the album to go with the single Live in La Vida Loca, because yeah. when Live in La Vida Loca blew up, they went, holy shit, we don't even have an album yet. <laughs> and uh, they had, dude, that's a session that, and that's yeah. in the book, that, Dude, when you do drum overdubs, 30 people don't usually show up to watch. It was so political. And I looked around and went, oh, my God. I felt like I was Kenny Kissinger trying to <laughs> negotiate the room. Anyway, so the, the, the way... <laughs> you are Kenny Kissinger. Kenny Kissinger. I know you are. Oh, dude, you can't have a career like this unless you are. Yeah. yeah, sure, sure. First of all, I say yes to everybody. Yep, I can do it. I can do it. Holy shit, I got three gigs in one day. How am I going to do this? One's in Zurich, one's in L.A., and one's in South America. Well, let me think. If I get on the plane here, I mean, yes, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, all right, so Modern Drummer put a list together, and I have to say, man, they, they, were, they picked some pretty cool songs, and then I supplemented and moved things in and out. Yeah. The, obviously, I had to have Mellencamp because the yeah. Mellencamp was the beginning of my, you know, professional career, and it was, and 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 those songs define who I am in this way. Uh, you know, when you're learning to play the drums, it's in or anybody who's learning when you're younger, it's all about you, me, 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 yeah. me, 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 me. How do I sound? How do I look? And you know, rightfully so, you've got a teacher saying, "No, Kenny, no, John, your stick is this," and and then you're being corrected and told, and and you're constantly checking, "Am I? Am I? How am I sounding?" How? Well, when I got in the John Mellencamp band, I had to quickly learn after I got fired after five weeks being in the band we were making this record i had no experience 
I didn't know, I didn't even have the mindset that my purpose as a drummer is one thing and one thing only. And nobody tells you this, by the way. You have to figure it out on your own. My goal as a session drummer or any session musician is one thing. Get the goddamn song on the radio to be a number one hit. So what do I play? What do I set up? What do I say? What do I don't say? What can, do I do? What is my goal it, to get that song on the radio? And it gets deeper than that. There's a thing called co-elevation that I, I learned from a book I read, Leading Without Authority by Keith Ferrazzi. And co-elevation is, if I come in and it's just about me, and by the way, it's not about me, it's about we. That's my whole yeah. point. I had Absolutely. to learn... Yeah. It's like being on a Super Bowl team or being in a great corporation with the, the people come together and create greatness. This is called co-elevation. So, John, if you were on my team or on my band, I'd go, I, it's not like I'd go like this. All right, John, look, I really care about you. I want to care about you because the benefits are huge. If I care about you, which I do, but, but besides that, to make a, a point, if I care about you and I want you to do a great job, this is great for you, but I also want you to care about me. Mm -hmm. And I want you to care about me. And so together we co-elevate and create greatness. This is how people win Super Bowls. So yeah. If, yeah. if I'm playing a great drum track and the guitar player is slacking, that means the song might not make it on the record, which won't get on the radio to become a number one hit single. So I'm there to serve the artist and the band, obviously, but I'm there to serve mm -hmm. the producer, definitely serve the guy who hired you or the sure. girl who hired you, <laughs> serve the musician, serve the, 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 the engineer, the assistant, everybody, the record label. It's all about, you gotta look around and get out of yourself and go, what can I do to help this situation out? That's how you become great. That's how you pivot from being the kid. It's about me, it's about me, that's fine. But at some point, to be great, you have to pivot out of that and move to the next level, which is, it's about us. Yep. That's where teams literally win the Super Bowls, and that's where bands are amazing. And it's a, what blows my mind is how many people are not aware of it, or if they're aware of it, shame on them for not acting on it. So anyway, picking yeah. the songs, yeah. had to pick Mellencamp because once Jack and Diane, John's biggest number one hit single came came out, he looked to me to come up, he played a song on acoustic guitar and I go, what do you got, Kenny? Yeah. Because yeah. he wanted, basically as a team player, I made the corporation millions and millions of dollars. John, John Cougar Mellencamp Inc. I made a million, so of course he's gonna look to me to make millions more. So I, um, that's why that band was iconic because I had to come up with the direction. Even if it was a simple beat like Small Town, which is just boom, ga, un, ga, un, ga. That was me going, okay, I've done this and this and this, but I've not done that, which is I'll keep this powerful, simple beat, no hi-hat at the beginning, to let the guitars be heard. Yeah. Yep. And to to let the people like, wow, what this is like, like Born in the USA by Springsteen. You know, which yeah. is this iconic arena thing. Then you have some place to go. My point is, I those songs, and there's about maybe eight of them there because they show the drummer's role and and, and what we're supposed to do to get the song to be number one. Then it, I start. I wanted to make sure. And Modern Drummer was very cool about this. They split off and just started to go into other areas stylistically. You know, like, well, the, the most radical one is Burning for Buddy when I recorded with the Buddy Rich Big Band. Sure. And what I played Dave Hakim, this virtuosic uh, violin concerto that I played on marimba at 22 years old at Indiana University. This was a violin concerto I saw Itzhak Perlman do with his encore. When I was a freshman at IU, I went, I know I have to do a mallet piece in my senior recital. One of four pieces I have to do. I'm going to play that one because it's so beautiful. And I literally spent two, three hours a day for 365 days for one year getting this piece ready for my senior recital. And my teacher, George Gaber, went, 
I think you should audition for this uh, uh, concerto competition. Mm -hmm. I won it, which meant I played with a 60-piece orchestra in an opera hall bigger than the New York Met at Indiana University, scared to death. Because I'm usually, you know, we're usually in the back. You know, when you walk out, there's this massive opera hall with a, a lot of people there. There's like 500 yeah. people there at Indiana University, the number one school of music at the con in the country at the time. They roll out the member. I walk out. I'm in a tuxedo, and I'm looking at the orchestra. I'm looking at the conductor. I'm looking at, and this piece, man, is blazing fast. Like, and um. Anyway, that piece will be in the book. Dave heard it and went, oh my God, does anybody ever heard this? I said, "Not. I, you know, I don't play it that much because in rock and roll, I don't want to, hey, look at my marimba. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so. Do you still play uh, a little marimba? Do you still, do you still play a little? No, no. I, I have a marimba at my studio and I, I told the engineer for Satriani, we got to get marimba on the album, but we haven't, we probably won't, but, um, I have it set up just with the idea that one day maybe I'll 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 play learn to play that piece of, or a piece of it, and anyway, yeah. so it's going to be in the book, and so th this is an example of um, the it's diversity that they're trying to. Yeah. We we got Tony Iommi from Sabbath. I did a band with Tony Iommi from Sabbath and Glenn Hughes from Deep Purple. We got a yeah. song from there. We got Cinderella. We got I think Psycho from. Uh, uh, Psycho, I think from a puddle of mud. We got Michelle Branch, Avril Lavigne. We went that way. We got um, yeah. oh, just all just a huge selection. So to show diversity, you know that. Oh, Melissa Etheridge is a song I did where it was two snare drums and uh, the 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 first part, the intros and the verses were kind of like you're on heroin, you know. Da 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 da. It's really deep wood snare drum. But when the chorus comes in, it's like, boom, it explodes. And so I had my regular snare drum in front of me. And this thing is like, it's so Jekyll and Hyde. So mm -hmm. I wanted that in there to, you know, I, you get the drift. I'm trying yeah, to show. Yeah. So that's how they came up with it. And yeah, and I, I tell a story about what was going on in every every situation. That's awesome. That's I, I want to read a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> keep talking about this stuff too, because this is this is great. Uh, my my old friend David Foster, not the David Foster you're thinking of. Wow. But but a, a, an old friend. We worked together at a music store at E Wurlitzer yeah. in Boston, and David oh, yeah. wanted to be the yeah, and he was the tour manager for John Cafferty and Beaver and the Beaver Brown Band. Wow. In the '80s, David, and he he met you. He he mentioned this to me this morning in a message. He said, um, he, I guess he met you when you were working with Marshall Crenshaw in '89. And then went, and well, then I think you told him at the time, or I think shortly after that, you were working with Bob Seeger. Yeah. And he, he he met you again, and he just he went on about how nice you were to him and everything, and just asking to talk about the differences between like Marshall Crenshaw. I saw you on that tour, by the way. You did. Is Marshall that where Crenshaw. we we were all lined up in the front, like all in a row? I think we were. You must because have been. it was yeah. Dude, that for the people listening, this was the craziest setup. Marshall Crenshaw said, all right, we're going to line up in front of the stage, all of us. So I'm on one end, drums, then I guess Graham may be the bass player, or maybe, yeah. yeah. And then it was then Marshall and then Glenn Burtnick, all in a line. Uh, if it's a tour, because I do remember it was all East Coast. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was like 89. I feel like it was the right yeah. I, not long after I started at Zildjian. And, uh, but I... David wants you to talk about those two different two different things, but I do want to say also, I was thinking about this this morning before I forget. Also in 1989, just to give people an idea, I mean, you were obviously still working with John Mellencamp. You were yeah. still like yeah. that was the big thing. But I saw you that summer with Jefferson Airplane at Great Woods, and I remember I came out to see you, and you introduced me to Sean Pelton, who was your protege well, slash yeah. student. You yeah. Remember? John wow. came up. I think his band opened. John Eddie was the yeah. band opening for yeah. And and you said I want you to meet this guy. He's a really good drummer. He's studied with me. He's a really good guy. Yeah. And there's kind of shy Sean Pelton. I oh, Sean, very very, very humble. Yeah. 
Yeah, very humble. That's wild, because, you know, I did the John Eddy record in Mellencamp Studio in Indiana, and I yeah. couldn't go on tour with John Eddy, and he said, do you know any drummers? I said, yeah, Sean <laughs> Pelton, and that's when Sean moved to New York. Right, right. Oh, that's that a great story. Our, yeah, thanks to you, that began a relationship yeah. with Sean, and then he got the SNL gig, I don't know, a few years after that. I don't know when it was. Oh, dude, yeah. that's a funny story. And by the way, Sean Pelton is the most cool. That guy is so humble. He always gives me so much love and credit. Uh, nobody does that, and it says a lot about Sean. That's why I'm, yeah. I'm, this is not about me, this is about him. But I'll never forget being in my kitchen in Indiana with no cell phone, it was a big long cord because I could walk from the living room to the dining room to the kitchen. Sean goes, hey, Kenny, Kenny, I need some advice. You know, uh, G.E. Smith um, said that the drummer, it might have been Matt Cam uh, Chamberlain might have been doing it. Yeah. And Matt yeah. says, he said they need a drummer and he offered me, he says, I don't know, man, what do you think? I don't want to be... You, you know, because Sean's very intelligent and he looks at things like from a perspective like, ah, should I be doing a TV show? I said, Sean, if you're going to do one fucking TV show, that's the one you do <laughs> Saturday Night Live. Oh, yeah. my God. That's yeah. the show. And yeah. <laughs> it's only so many weeks a year. And I remember Sean was like, uh, and here he is. He's like, what is it, 80 years later? <laughs> yeah, I, it's it's got to be close to 30, right? I mean, I yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's it was the perfect gig for him. Anyway, that that show at the it was a Great Woods. They yeah. called it Great Woods back then. God, yeah. I, dude, you know, you played there a thousand go, times. Yeah, but different. going to Great Woods as a fan in the audience, and then being on that stage in that beautiful arena especially in the summer and the smell uh, you know of the trees and the grass and and yeah. ev all the security guys back there knew me they'd know me if i went to the they, uh, some of them worked like then at the boston garden or at the beacon right. which That's you've right. seen me at all these places and the jefferson airplane when i was a kid i mean i could have been 13 14 and i went to tanglewood and i saw the Jefferson Airplane with the Joshua Light Show and Gray Slits up there and dancing and, you know, White Rabbit and Somebody to Love and Funny Cars. And I'm just, you know, like, wow, wow. Now I'm yeah. on tour with them? Okay. Dude. Yeah. The, and then at Great Woods? I mean, it was like, that was the most amazing like turnaround where you that the only one that beats it is me playing honoring the Beatles and getting to play with Ringo and Paul after seeing them at ten years old on my T V set and going, Holy shit, what who are those people, Mom? And she <laughs> said, They're the Beatles. I went, Well, I wanna play with the Beatles. Call them up, get me in the band. I, I, I gotta do this. I wanna play drums. I'm like, fuck the piano, shit. I'm playing drums. <laughs> drums Drums! I went running around the table screaming, drum, drums, drums! Ripped up the piano music and threw it at my mom. <laughs> she, she, uh, you know, she, uh, she never I called knew, the Beatles up. <laughs> she never, I knew you loved the Beatles, but when I read your book, um, you talk about that in the book, and that was so cool where you said, like, you, it, you just what you just said, you saw that on Ed, saw them on Ed Sullivan, and you went like, holy shit, that's it. Yeah, that's I it. Wanna, I, I want to, and, and like, a bunch of times you mentioned it in the book, like, like I want to be in that band. I want to. This, this is, this is. Yeah. One, I remember you were thinking like, this is. I, I, I'm playing in this band right now, you know, in, in, uh, you know, Stockbridge. Yeah. And it's one step closer to being in the Beatles. Like you, you had, yeah. the, which is so great. You had this dream, like I'm gonna yeah. get in that band, man. Yeah. And <laughs> that's the, uh, the, 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 the Cinderella story is, I did. For a second, <laughs> fifth, fifty years later. Oh my God! Uh, but but the thing is, okay. I mean, and that's the beauty of that story. And you know, of course, my mom didn't call the Beatles up. She went to Manny's music though. Uh, they saw that. Whoa, Jesus Christ! They saw me blossom. And for the people listening, you know, uh, the bottom line, the, the big takeaway is, without even knowing what these words mean. When I saw them, it wasn't just coming from here. It was coming from my heart. Yeah. 
I realized at that moment what my purpose in life was, what my bliss, my desire. You know, Socrates says that happiness is about realizing what your purpose in life is. What are we? What the fuck are you doing here, for everybody? Ask yourself, what the fuck are you doing here? When you realize that, and not every, not not everybody can figure that out in this lifetime. Yeah. But so I didn't know any of that shit. All I knew was like, ah, I gotta do this, <laughs> and. So my parents being <laughs> cool, <laughs> my parents being cool, went, well, they go down to Manny's, they were in New York, and they go and they get a snare drum. And, and this is so funny how times have changed. My mom went, well, I don't know if my kid's going to really play this forever. She didn't know nothing about drums. She said, Mrs. Aronoff, if your son doesn't like this drum, you bring it back, we'll give you your money back. Who says uh -huh. that? I know who says that. <laughs> oh <my. laughs> and so, so I, I, all I could afford was a snare drum and a cymbal, and I was a gardening dude at twenty five cents an hour. Yeah. The funny side story is I, there was one time that lady yelled at me because I was pulling out all the plants and keeping the weeds. I got it. I flipped it. <laughs> I'm pulling out. I'm pulling out flowers. They didn't have flowers on them. They were just green things and they were tall so I thought they were weeds I'm pulling out you know million dollar flowers and I oh, show she says what did you do you you told the flowers out she's crying and yelling at me <laughs> you left the weeds and you pulled out the flowers <laughs> see John I'm supposed to be a drummer not a gardener <laughs> yeah. exactly. so, so I am uh, <laughs> I started a band uh, and we played Beatles music. Now check this out. I don't know if I mentioned this in the book. I might have. Yeah, I think I did because I just read the book. Okay, the year that I did that CBS special, The Night That Changed America, honoring the Beatles, where I get to play with Paul and Ringo, same year I get a call to do a Brian Wilson record. Now you have to understand, at 10 years old, my first record I bought at 10 was uh, Surf and Safari by the, Be uh, by the Beach Boys. Second yeah. record was Meet the Beatles. And by the way, everybody, the way I got those, those records, I lived, and John knows, you know, that Lee Mass is exit two on the turnpike is three miles from my house in Stockbridge. I got on my fat tire, <laughs> one speed bike, like the witch from the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm driving, you know, to the lean ass, and I have a basket. I get a record and put it in there, and then drive back and put it on my parents' turntable. And wow. so that year that I played with the Beatles was the same year I got to record with Brian Wilson. Is that crazy or that's what? That's unbelievable, man. That's yeah. But the takeaway is this. Yeah. That's... The takeaway is this. So. I lived by my purpose without even knowing what that was. You know, I played in bands all through junior high and high school, and there was no school of rock to go to. Berkeley was mostly still a jazz school, yeah. and there was no school of rock. So I studied, I went to UMass, the University of Massachusetts, because I was so, to study classical music and be a performance major. And then I, Long, I, I, got, I, I got into Aspen School of Music, which you know, run by Juilliard, second school what the top three schools of classical music was indiana university juilliard and eastman and i told my dad look i gotta get i gotta go i want to i want to go to one of those schools even though i wasn't that great at classical music trust me my because in high school i was a rock jock i was a uh, in bands playing in the clubs yeah. when i was 13 and i played sports i didn't want to play in an orchestra with clarinets and you know people ugh. I was playing Zeppelin, Hendrix, you know, James Brown, Almond Brothers, Stones. I mean, forget that shit. And I didn't march. So my reading skills and working with conductors was not very good. Anyway, I go to UMass. I, I go to audition for John Beck up at Eastman. I get in, but there's no room for me uh, because they only take so many students. So there's this girl, you know the story because it's in my book. I end up at Aspen School of Music, run my Juilliard, get my ass kicked, so bad, I'm the worst percussionist there. But the teacher who taught there was the head of the department at Indiana University, and I demanded to audition. And he tried to convince me not to. And I just, because this is all, this all comes from a place of purpose and desire. Because yeah. if it was up here, you'd go, oh, okay. 
No, I'm like, no, no, figure it out. And so I get in, I work my way to the top. I spent four consecutive years auditioning for your ex-father-in-law, you know, Vic, uh, Firth, who's the timpanist of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, created the greatest, stick, the biggest stick company in the world. And Vic, I, I, I auditioned yeah. for him. I sucked. You know, he was really nice, but I sucked. I come back the next year. He used to tell I, me that. No, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. He, he, He's go, he never, oh my God. He, he you know, I know. Uh, he, oh, did he? He, he loved you. Oh yeah, he loved me. He was the coolest. We were like brothers. Anyway, so I, uh, I, I, no, I come back a third year. Nope, and then I start studying with him privately. You know, in the summer. I come back a fourth year, I get in. It was six guys from New England Conservatory, his, his the guys he taught there, and me. Yeah. And so I get into Tanguid, and for the people who don't know, Tanguid is the premier, number one student orchestra in the country, if not the world, under the uh, tutelage of the Boston Symphony Orchestra and Vic Firth being our mentor, where I get to work with Leonard Bernstein, Aaron Copeland, you know, the greatest American yeah. composers and, and conductors. And then, although Aaron Copeland was kind of all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and uh, Arthur Fiedler and Sergio Zauer. And anyway, I get into the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra. I did it. Yeehaw! And I, and I turn it down. Why? Because of purpose. I was like, I literally turned down a job, you guys certainty for complete uncertainty i had nothing and i i but i wanted to be in a rock band so that point my point is seeing the beatles on tv ignited this thing and thank god i followed my heart and not my brain not what i should do but what i need to do what i have to do and so i moved back home humbly and practiced eight hours a day studied with uh alan dawson in boston Lexington, to be more specific, and then uh, Gary Chester in New York moved to Indiana, form a band. The idea is to get a record deal and, and make records, go on tour. It didn't happen, and that brought me to Mellencamp. But those moves, that move of turning down Jerusalem was based on purpose and desire, and that is what has fueled my career. That is what's made me successful and stay successful. I'm like a running back. I get a touchdown, I want the ball immediately again. Again. Mm -hmm. When Jack and Diane went to number one with Mellencamp, I mean, I could have gone, oh my God. And Hurt So Good was at number two. We win two Grammys. I mean, at that moment, our song, and back then, folks, there was not 30 charts out there. You had album charts, in right. single charts. If you were right. number one in any of those categories, the whole, every radio station, every TV station was playing your music. So when I went to number one, I was celebrating for two seconds. And then I went totally into fear mode, like, oh my God, I'm not number one. I'm thinking Steve Gadd, Steve Smith, uh, you know, Peter Erskine, Billy Cobham, Neil Peart. I'm like, oh my God, I'm nothing like those guys. I didn't, I didn't understand how uh, I didn't understand my place because I still, you know, when you're young, you think technique and chops is where it's at and only where it's at. But I didn't realize the value of less is more. And so I was immediately going, I'm not number one. I got, And I said, I got to do this again to prove that I can do this. But I don't even know the song yet. And what am I going <laughs> to play? I mean, my head's going. <laughs> and that, that type of thing has fueled me to still... At the, to this day, at, at 105, uh, <laughs> I think I need a facelift. But other than that, I'm doing pretty good, right? And no, uh, you, you're doing. <laughs> I got to tell you, just really quick, David Wasikinen, our good buddy from the Hoos. yeah, David's gonna kill me because he's trying to get me to do a show. Sorry, Dave. Eight in the morning is too early. <laughs> And by the way, Dave, I made John move his thing back so I could wake up and have coffee and That's my right. lemon and water and, you know, we, one we hand. Accommodate. <laughs> yeah. Dave, I'm going to do your show. Let's, uh, we're going to do it. All right. So anyway, he, I. He, he commented he on said, how great you look. He was just asking, uh, what else do you do besides drumming to stay so fit? Oh, well, I have a, the eight steps to a healthy life. 
But, you know, I was a rock jock, so I always was like, you know, from ever yeah. since I was a kid, I was into a, staying in shape. And your body memorizes. You do this stuff when you're young. It's it's a lot easier because you're, you're, your body understands this is the way we live. And then I came up with the eight steps. I can kind of briefly go through them if people want to hear this. What do you sure. think? Yeah, yeah. All right. It's, I'll try to be as succinct as possible. So the first step for a healthy life is, which I call a healthy life is a wealthy life, um, is is lifting weights. And you don't have to lift like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But the whole purpose, I mean, even push-ups is lifting weights. The whole purpose of, of, of that type of exercise is it, it does make you stronger, it, mm-hmm. it, but, it, but more importantly, it keeps your hormone levels up. You know, for men, your hormone levels start going down in your 20s, believe it or not. I don't know what it is with women, but it's probably close to that. So when it keeps your hormone levels up, that keeps you youthful. It mm-hmm. also keeps your immune system up. Very important, so Very for important. disease. Yep. So that's that. Okay, so your strength, uh, hormones keep you young, youthful, um, and your immune system up. Cardio, only way you can exercise the heart. Yep. And, you know, if the heart goes, you're kind of over. So so, uh, act, so, some form of cardio. And I, I, I'm i a type of guy, I'll invest whatever I need to do to stay healthy. You know, the best equipment in my house. You know, I have a little gym in my house. And uh, so, and cardio also elevates your hormone levels, which elevates your immune system. And then mm-hmm. the third thing is some form of stretching. So you've got strength, endurance, and flexibility. I mean, this is like the foundation. Yeah. Number yeah. four, which is definitely the foundation, is what you eat or what you don't eat. Yeah. And this is a battle. This is a constant struggle. I mean, you know, you see a hot dog. Ah, fuck it. I'll eat that thing. That's fine. But don't do it seven days a week. Right. All right. So without getting, everybody pretty much should know how to eat. Uh, But, you know, definitely vegetables. And I'm a meat eater, by the way. I eat chicken, fish, and red meat. Uh, I am wired. I mean, eating that stuff to me is like like drugs. I mean, I just feel. But as you get older, you should flip your portions. You know, first of all, buy the best meat best fish, best chicken, and also eat more vegetables and less meat, you know, yeah, yeah. and and, and that control, type of thing. Yeah. Um, try to stay away from fried foods. Try to stay away from sugars, processed foods. You know, and by the way, you know, the Ten Commandments are there for people to look at. Let's say they're on the wall. Oh, yeah, that's right. Thou shalt not do this. Thou shalt not do that. This eight steps, it's the same thing. If you're aware of them every day, then at least you're trying to, to oh, okay, I kind of messed up yesterday. I didn't this, I didn't that. Okay, today, it's in your mindset. And this is better than no mindset. All right, so, uh, and by the way, uh, okay, okay it, I mean, I can say like, you know, when I wake up in the morning, my, my thing, the ideal thing today to do is, Wake up, have a glass of water with uh, squeezed uh, lemons. Mm-hmm. Some s- lemons are the best, oranges or some citrus. But lemons actually take your body and make it from alkaline to, to base. And alkaline is will head you into a cancer direction. Uh, your body, uh, cancer loves alkaline. Viruses like uh, the COVID like alkaline. So I immediately take uh, that. The ideal thing is, you do that, wait 30 minutes, and then fresh squeeze celery juice. Now, mm-hmm. celery juice takes inflammation out of your body and also is ridiculously healthy for you, not combined with any other f- vegetables. Okay. That's the study I did. So celery juice, I mean, I take a tall glass. It's like, you know, I hold my nose and do it. Yeah. And and all of this, by the way, is, is leading me to my greatest desire in the morning, coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Dude. I'm like, I want that coffee right away. And by the way, this is me on just the double espresso. I haven't even had the, the rest of it yet. But anyway, so so those things. Then now you can get into eating, you know, eggs. My wife is a killer cook. She'll make these 
European egg things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or I have a protein shake. I go vegan and non-vegan. I put in a scoop of peanut butter. Fat will curtail your, your appetite. I put in a cup of blueberries. Fruits and vegetables, very good for your diet. The blueberries, yeah. sugar, no, uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, processed sugar. Uh, I put in fish oil, which I'll get into the next state, step five, which is supplements. Fish oil is like incredible, or some sort of uh, omega-3, 6, and 9. It's very, very good for, you know, every like 30 different things in your body, including hair, which obviously didn't work for me. Although, I grow hair everywhere but my head. You know, I have to shave my eyeballs sometimes. <laughs> you know, anyway, anyway, anyway. <laughs> you know, so um, and then I'll put in green, super green food. A power. This I take these yeah. things on the yeah. road with me. That's why I have a super green. And then yeah, and and so that'll be starting during the day. It's like chicken, vegetables, that type of thing. One of my weaknesses is nuts, but. The only thing that's bad about nuts is if you eat too many, you can put on fat. Yeah, okay, yeah. so number four is, but it's good, is diet. It's good fat, though. It is good fat. Yeah, yeah, at yeah. least it's that. Avocado is also a good fat. Okay, uh, number five is supplements. Because I, I'm a, such a workaholic and I uh, travel so much, uh, I, I, I've got, I'm on a supplement regime. I've been on that since, God, the 80s. When we were traveling in Mexico 30 years ago, you were taking vitamin supplements, I remember, yeah. every morning. In yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I have a, and by the way, a company you guys can check out is called P-U-R-E, Pure. And they're great if you did only one thing, get the ultra nutrient. Uh, there's an ultra nutrient. I think it's, is it for men and women? But it's just a very, very full range, powerful multivitamin organic. My doctor recommended it and he's very into you know, staying youthful and preventing illness. And yeah. uh, and then also, and this is very important during the pandemic, I've been doing this for years, but D3, I'll take 10,000 units of D3 mm -hmm. made by Pure. This also, this helps uh, 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 keep your immune system up. Yeah. Another one to take by Pure is zinc. Yeah. I, I can't remember if it's zinc citrate, I believe. I take one of those a day. Uh, also, you can get by pure uh, quercetin. Oh my God! Don't ask me to spell it. Qu quercetin. Anyway, quercetin is great. It encapsulates your cells and will prevent viruses to get into your cells. Okay. The virus could be in your body, but it it will help you uh, prevent the illness to get into your cells. Because once an illness or a virus like uh, coronavirus gets into your cells, that's a whole another level of it yeah. then being just in your body. So quercetin, uh, I take trace elements by uh, Pure. Um, and then uh, this fish oil, as I mentioned, uh, yeah. is omegas is real good. And then uh, we'll just leave it at that right now. But those are like and vi extra vitamin C, although your multiple vitamin has the vitamin C. And let's leave it at that as a great foundation. Uh, and uh, yeah, okay. And then uh, number six, which is water. Now, every organ, every organ in your body needs water. You literally will die after three days with no water. You can go 40 days without food, but water, man. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the, the basic rule of thumb is whatever your weight is, cut it in half, and that's how many ounces you should drink. A day. This is a challenge for me because I naturally don't even, I'm never thirsty. So, well, if there's a glass of whiskey, suddenly I get thirsty, but other than that, no, but, <laughs> but, how <laughs> oh, that's funny. I'm thirsty. <laughs> um, or wine, red wine. But uh, the, the water, you know, yeah. Yep. let's say I'm 170 pounds, so I, whatever half of that is, I should drink in ounces throughout the day. Ounces. Yep. Yeah, so eight, 85 ounces of water I should drink a day. Um, and then, uh, okay, water. Now we're getting into, that's number six. The next one is stress is one of the worst things for health because if you're stressed, it just can make you ill mentally, physically, emotionally, everything. So some form of meditation or whatever you need to do to reduce stress. 
There's a guy called Wim Hof, W-I-M, is it H-U-F-F or H-O-F-F? He's a breathing expert. It's a very, very big thing these days, breathing. And there's a, a breathing uh, exercise that, that he can take you through. It's as, sh as short as 11 minutes. But it's basically breathing in and out 30 times, holding your breath for, for well, you're supposed to hold for a minute, then a minute and a half, and then two minutes. I can't. I can get to a minute and a half at the best. And uh, the whole thing is you're breathing like this. <sighs> I mean, heavy. And you expand yeah. your stomach. Breathing is like, as if, like, you know how dogs after, or any animal, if they, let's say an animal antelope is being chased by a lion. It's terrified. It goes into fight, fight or flight mode. And when it's done, it shakes its whole body out. Well, the breathing exercise does that. It shakes everything. You'll be blown away. Everybody should do this when we get off this thing. And okay. yeah. you, you do it 30 minutes. You do three sets. And breathe heavy. And then you, you let your air out and hold for, try a minute. If you can't, I do 45 seconds. I'll do it in my car. Sometimes I'm about yeah. to pass out. I stop. But I'm like, oh, shit. Uh, and then, <laughs> And after you hold your breath, uh, then let it out. Um, oh, you inhale and hold that for 15 seconds. Do that three times. And it just kind of wakes you up and shakes yeah. you all, everything. And this is a, a stress reducer also. Kelly's big into this stuff with, yeah. with her stress, yoga stuff. Yes. Yeah. It's a very big thing these days, this yeah. breathing. All right. So, or meditation, whatever. All right. And the final thing is, which is a difficult one for me, is sleep. It's very important to get seven to eight hours of sleep. I, mm -hmm. I get up like five times a night because my brain is always going. But, and then I go back to sleep. And what sleep does, it's the only time your brain and your body can repair. And, yeah. and it's yeah. very important. And your brain repairing, and I've gotten into a lot. My doctor's an expert on PTS and, uh, 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 what's the other? It's basically trauma to the brain. Trauma to the brain can come from... Uh, you, anyway, the point is when you sleep, it's like taking the gray matter or the ashes out of the fireplace, out of your brain, and then let it repair. It's also the only time your your brain can memorize what you did during the day. So yeah. sleep is essential for body and, and brain repair. And like the heart, if the brain goes, you're done. Yeah. No, that's, like the, that's great yeah. stuff, Kenny. Yeah. I want to read a couple quick, uh, got so many great comments here, but mm. by the way, we got tons of people watching. This is so great. Um, our old friend, Jerry Donegan, my old Jerry! Friend, good old Jerry. I hope he's still watching a few minutes ago. He commented, I just thought you'd get a kick out of this because it's a great story and maybe you can even tell it, but he said, Kenny, um, I don't know where it went, but he said, uh, you've come a long way. Oh, there it is. Kenny long way from Zildjian day in Chicago. Don't stop rocking. Oh my God! The, John, you I, weren't you weren't there yet, were you? I wasn't there yet. It was a few years before my time, but, okay. but it's a yeah, it's a great story. All right, so um, this was uh, Zildjian did these incredible events. Uh, maybe there were four of them: one in L.A., one in Chicago, one in New York, and one in Boston, I believe. That, that's right. Yeah. Something like that. And, and they were these, Dallas at that point too. Oh, Dallas. Been. So yeah. what it was was it was like a, they'd have like six amazing drummers. And everybody would come into a theater. And uh, Armand Zildjian, this is when Armand and I became uh, brothers from a different mother at the hip. Get it, because, baby. Get it, baby. And we, he had a big nose like me. And we, he, he, he was a good illustrator. And he made he a picture good. one Christmas, a card to me, and with our noses. Oh, no, actually, we took a picture. And he'd say, you could drive a Cadillac between us with the doors open and still wouldn't touch us because <laughs> our noses were so big. I remember that. Remember that? Same yeah, with the ham show every year too. Yeah. Yeah. You'd every year. He'd, he'd hug you and you'd hug yeah. him. And like, you could drive a Cadillac between us and yeah, with the doors <laughs> just, open. Yeah. yeah so, <laughs> so anyway, Lenny Demuzio was uh, artist relations at that time. You know. <laughs> And he was also Kenny, baby. Yeah. So I called, I just finished my first big tour with Mellencamp. And uh, it was American Fools. So we had a number one album out. We were huge. All ever, you know, we were on Saturday Night Live, blah, blah, blah. So I call up Lenny because I'm living in Indiana and I want to go up to the Zillion Day. I call up Lenny. Lenny, 
this is Kenny Aronoff. Hey, Kenny. Um, hey, I would like to go to that Zildjian Day. And he says, oh, man, we'll get you tickets. You want one or two, just me. He says, and you can sleep at the Zildjian Lounge. You know, I'm like, all right, party with Lenny and, and Armand and let's <laughs> rock. And that's a Monday. Lenny calls me back on Tuesday. He says, hey, Kenny, I got you all sorted out. He goes, hey, hey listen, um, uh, you're coming, right? I said, yeah. He says, well, you know, uh, Tommy Aldridge with Ozzy and I don't know who he was at that point, Pat yeah. Travers. Tommy Aldridge is having twins. I went, oh, that's awesome. I'm a twin. Tell him congratulations. He says, yeah, yeah, I will. Okay, so uh, anyway, his babies are due... Uh, this week. I'm like, oh, wow, that's cool. Tell him congratulations. <laughs> he says, yeah, well, what I'm trying to find, <laughs> he says, we have to replace him. We need another drummer. I says, oh, man, who are you going to get? <laughs> and he goes, you. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> and I'm, uh, first of all, I'm off tour. My drums are in some storage unit. I'm preparing for my first of three weddings. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. <laughs> and, uh, I'm like, holy shit. You know, after being on the, literally on the road for nine months, I kind of was just take, chilling. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I went, what? Steve Gadd is playing. Uh, Bernard Purdy's playing. The great Larry London the, the number one session guy in Nashville. Yeah. Uh, Steve Smith from Journey's playing. Uh, I can't remember who else the other guys, but anyway, and it was Tommy Aldridge and it was one other yeah. person. I think it was Ralph McDonald. So I'm like, I was going up there to see my heroes and now I have to perform? I'm <laughs> crapping in my pants. So this is a pinnacle moment. I get the drums out and... Uh, I'm like, okay, do I be the Kenny before Mellencamp or do the Kenny that's now in Mellencamp? One is chops or one is less is more. And you have to understand, you know, you're like, you want to wow everybody. But I'm going, but I don't play like that anymore. And But I'm just starting to learn how to play less is more. I'm like, what the hell do I do? So, you know, I put together a drum solo and a thing and I kind of went the direction of... Yeah. I am now this drummer, the John Mellencamp drummer, serve the song, but still wishing I could be Steve Smith, Steve Gadd, all this stuff. Anyway, I'm crapping in my pants. I put together a program. I go up there. The The night before, I or the day before, I set up in this big, big, huge theater, and they said, um, yeah, set up your drums. I'm, I'm getting them tuned. In walks Steve Smith. I'm like, oh, my God. And Steve has got a concert that night with Journey, but he's setting up this massive sonar kit that they've created. And he, he's so friendly and so nice. He's yeah. setting it up. Then he moves the kit right in front of mine. Uh, and um, and by the way, I think Zildjian, who was ever running it, it might have been Rab, I don't know, Rab Zildjian. I think it was Rab, yeah. Rab was there. They said, set your drum kit up right in the front because you're going first i'm like oh my god and steve moves his drums right in front of mine he goes let's jam i'm like are you kidding me so in about five minutes i'd gone through everything i know <laughs> and steve is like <laughs> you know and, um, yeah, know steve. Rab, yeah. rab leaves Comes back three hours later, and we're still playing. And Steve, yeah, Steve, he pushed me and pushed me. Then he said, let's switch drum kits. I mean, Steve is a consummate student learner, nicest yeah. guy in the world, just blowing me. And I, he's pushing me, pushing me. The point of that story is he made it so that I wasn't as nervous the next day because here I was in a bubble with Steve Smith. The guy with the most chops, the most chops of the whole day, yeah. And he 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 helped me out in that regard, and you know the next day, uh, I am crapping in my pants, and the curtain opens up. I'm the first guy, 
and the audience is looking for Tommy Aldridge's <laughs> massive double bass drum kit, and there's a simple drum kit. <laughs> and they're like, yeah! Ugh. Lenny, Lenny's got his arm around me, and I'm like, I'm shaking. And Larry London was the greatest. He he, yeah. he picked me up and he said, dude, you got this. Just be Kenny Aronoff. You know, and uh, I'm like nervous. I walk out there and Lenny goes, hey, he explained it to the audience. The audience didn't give a shit. They were pissed off that Tommy Aldridge wasn't there. <laughs> and who is this fucking half-balding guy play, <laughs> playing... Play with, with Johnny Cougar. We want we want fucking Sabbath. Yeah. So, dude, I mean, but I being me, very positive, I fucking crush it. And I only had one bass drum pedal. And I I and and, and what I was working on back then was the double bass drum by playing between the floor tom and your right foot. 16 notes, and with my left hand, I would be playing all these different patterns, and I'd switch to my left hand doing and I was doing that, and that, and I remember demonstrating that people were like, whoa, and then one smart ass, by the way, Armand and the, and the guy who ran Downbeat Magazine are sitting right in front of me, but Armand's going yeah. like this. Yeah. Was that guy called Jack? Yeah, uh, I I know exactly yeah. who you're talking. He was so, in the, but, but Armand yeah. Yeah. Armand is the it's like supporting me like I'm his son. So anyway, some I said I'd been studying with Alan Dawson, blah, and some smartass out there goes, "Hey, show me something you learned from Alan Dawson." Well, I had page thirty-seven out of Stick Control memorized. Ooh. I went, I went, okay. So, so this is what Alan taught, teaches us. We can do, when you play the line, every time you hit a quarter note, you hit the kick drum and the cymbal. If it ends up in your left hand, you do it that way. If it ends up in your right hand, you do it that way. And in between, you treat, eat, you swing the rhythm. Ba, 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 That's the first line. So in between, you... You create triplets. Ba ba do ba ba da ba ba do ba ba do ba ba do ba ba do ba do ba. So you're going ba ba, and every time you hit the an eighth note, you accent the snare drum. Ba do ba do bu ba bu ba bu ba bu bu ba bu bo ba do. You're going ba ba do ba da ba ba, and then you do it with rolls. There were three different ways to do it, and he said Alan would say you just at your discretion. Go between the three different ones. Dude, I went there, played the whole page. The audience stood up, went, yeah. oh my God. Yep. And fuck, Arm I mean, it was Armand was like, you know who's out in that audience? I keep running into all these famous drummers. Uh, who's the, I'm spacing his name. Badass drummer. Bebop played with Josh Groban, played with Alanis Morissette. He was from Chicago. Um, uh, his dad and mom both were pianists. Oh. Uh, Gary Novak. Yeah. Gary was 13 years old in the audience. Yes. Yeah. And I, if anybody doesn't know who Gary Novak is, he's oh. like, he plays. One of the, yeah. Yeah. Baddest his of all bads. Yeah. yeah. His parents were both jazz pianists. And so yeah. he grew up, he could play piano, bass, and drum set. And he told me, of course, I love this. I think he was the fastest sprinter in his high school. A white guy. I yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Well, if you look at him now, you'd think he can't even fucking walk. But no, he I'm was joking. When I, when I, he when he was a kid, he was a pretty wiry little, little yeah. Dude, he that was I mean, he guy. was. Yeah. Anyway, so that day, and I, that was the scariest moment. But that was one of those you know pivotal moments in your life. Yeah. And then yep. you know Armand went out, got me hammered on some Greek liquor. <laughs> Ah, can I have, I have this? I mean, after four shots, I was doing this over my shoulder. <laughs> I remember. So, Kenny, I remember they had Zildjian had a uh, a promo video of those Zildjian days before I worked there. Really? I got, yeah, I got a hold of it, and there's a video of you either during the clinic or maybe it was during sound check. And I told you about this later. You wow. were you were you were playing, 
and you were playing the the groove to mental hopscotch by missing persons do you remember that like you were just kind of like playing and then you started you started going da 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 oh yeah oh my god you remember that like yeah i know that beat yeah if anybody finds that and you were doing as you said you were doing a lot of left yeah. and right hand like, type yeah, yeah. stuff like which i had no idea i'd seen the video of hurts so good um yeah, left with hand, you playing yeah. left hand lead but i didn't yeah. know you you know you were really for real playing some left-handed right-handed cool shit well thanks so. to alan dawson he opened the door and gary chester gary's the one that taught me i mean i sent a letter to gary telling him guess what you taught me to play out of he was just developing new breed and yeah. he yeah, I sent him a letter when Hurts So Good went to number two and the album went to number one. I said, Gary, thanks for making me aware of left-handed lead because I was trying to dumb my playing down to learn how to play simple. John Mellencamp was very aware of that the groove sounded different left-handed because I was a beginner playing left-handed. He loved that kind of beginner vibe. And kind of uh, garage band sort of vibe. Yeah. yeah. And when yeah. I could do my drum fills with my right hand around the toms and keep that hi hat going. And that song was so simple that you'd hear that if you took the hi hat out, it sounded like, whoa, something went away. And yeah. I thank yeah. Gary and Gary, somebody's got that letter and they sent either sent it to me or a copy. And there it is. I mean, thank you, Gary. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. My it's my amazing. buddy Neil Porter from my band yeah. said uh, he's, he just wants to get your thoughts on the fact that the Patriots and, uh, and Tampa Bay are going to play in game four this, this season, I, I guess at Fox at Gillette, Brady and Gronk are coming back home to play the Patriots. So, Oh man, that, I don't know well, if you heard that. That's going to be, no, huge. I didn't know that they're going to play the Patriots. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Well, you know, <laughs> I'm a huge, I'm, I'm just a massive fan yeah of Brady and Belichick and the Patriots, even though, you know, I became a big Colts fan because I became very friendly with the uh, owner of the uh, Indianapolis yeah. Colts because I was living in Indiana. When you, they start flying you on the team plane, it's hard oh, yeah. not to be a fan, you know. Yeah. But uh, I am a huge, 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 massive fan of Belichick, the Patriots, and Tom Brady. And it just pisses me off, as you know. It just absolutely pisses me off that somebody would ever say, well, the Patriots, man, they win too many Super Bowls and and, and Brady, I don't like him. He's one, that's like saying, oh man, Einstein, I hate him because he came yeah. up with too many formulas. <laughs> what the, what the fuck's wrong with you? Yeah, exactly. The, you, yeah. you, either you admire excellence, you go ahead and try win super, seven Super Bowls. You know, I mean, this I is know. not, this is no luck. When you win one, maybe, but when you start winning seven, that's not luck at all. And yeah. shame on you for not admiring somebody, a human being that can do that and push the envelope. That's how we get to Mars. That's how we get to the moon. That's how we invent cures for coronavirus. That's how we uh, right. create the, the electric car. That's how, that's, that's how humankind moves forward. And Brady, is a living legend in that regard. He is a Picasso. He's a, a, a Da Vinci. He's he's a, a, you know Tesla. He's uh, these yeah. guys. Uh, you know a Rockefeller who created Standard Oil. He has done things that no man has ever done. That we should admire him for it. Hell with if it's your team or not. That's yeah. incredible. Right. And I tell people. Yeah. After two weeks after the Super Bowl, I said, guess what Brady's doing right now? He's preparing for the next Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. He may not be in the gym, but up here, because it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's not a job. This is what separates him from other people. Dude, it's not just him up on with the football in his hand. It's a whole it's a whole lifestyle. And yeah, that absolutely. I was I respect that. I respect yeah. that. I mean, the, the fact that he, you know, and, and we won't, for all the non-football fans, we won't, <laughs> we won't take up too much time, but, but the fact that he went to Tampa Bay and, you know, I mean, I, I won't say turn the team around, but yeah, people, people were saying with Brady, they might have a shot at making the playoffs or whatever, yeah. you know, whatever they were predicting or thinking, but man, to win, the, win the Super Bowl 
it's just it's it was unbelievable. It, it was, was unbelievable, like a, and yeah. and it wasn't just you know, and it's a team sport, and and and, yeah, and obviously that's right. What time is it? Oh, oh, oh! I have an appointment. Um, what good? That's my wife, Gina. You want to come on live? This is my, this is Gina. She never oh does this. She oh, never Gina? does this. Yeah. <laughs> that's my beautiful <laughs> wife. That's an amazing cook. How are you? Nice to see you. Start dancing, Gina. <laughs> I can't hear. It. She can't oh, hear. Okay. She can't Here hear. Yeah. Hi, Gina. Oh. Nice to see you. Nice to hear you. Yeah, it's nice to see yeah, you. Yeah, you too. Yeah, it's been How's a while. It? It's, it's, How's it going? It's, it's, it's going great. It's going great. Very happy that things are getting back to normal. So. Yeah, I like your drum room. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to keep up with your husband, you know. Yeah. See, there's a big picture of me on the wall. Oh, no, he took it down. <laughs> All right. I've, hey, everybody, okay. that's my wife. And uh, I guess she's reminding me we have an appointment. So um, okay. I would just want to also say this much with regard to the excellence of Tom Brady. When Tom Brady, and I, he, I aspire to be Tom Brady at whatever I do. When Tom Brady walks on the field, his presence affects his team. His presence affects the opposing team. They yeah. respect him. They admire him and they fear him. When the people in the stadium, they go, oh my God, that's Tom Brady. They respect him and admire him. The people all over the world watching him admire him and say, what's he going to do? I can't wait to see what this guy's capable of doing. He inspires his team. His defense was unbelievable. They completely took Kansas City out. Yeah. They completely took, you know, uh, uh, you know, Mahomes Mahomes. out, which took out uh, the fastest running, fastest runner in football, you know, Derrick Hill. I mean, and that allowed Tom Brady to do his thing. But Tom inspired the defense. He inspires everybody. And the inspiration comes because that guy they know is as working as hard as they are, if not harder yeah. And that's why you put a guy like that on your team. Talk about co-elevation. He is there before everybody, and he's the last guy to leave, and he's training before everybody, mentally, physically, emotionally, and physically, uh, spiritually. This guy is an inspiration to any team, no matter what. And that's why he took Tampa Bay yeah. and lifted them to the next level. And that's that's what I try to do when I am in the studio, with people or not, or uh, when I'm practicing by myself, I'm still trying to be that guy when nobody's around. Yeah, it's yeah. a light. It's a lifestyle. It's like you either want to be great, twenty four seven or not. You can't wait for when you're on the field. You've got to be training every day to be great, every minute, constantly, so that when you are on the field, you're already there. That's why the correlation between Tom Brady, the Patriots, and excellence in any field, in anything you do, your relationship, your diet, lifestyle is so important. And this yeah. is a great way to end the, the, this event. <laughs> well, I, before you go, I want to just say a couple of quick things. I know you got to go because you've got an appointment. Yeah. And thank you for doing this, Kenny, first of all. Of course. But <clears throat> having, having worked with you for many, many years, I'm so honored to be your friend for 30 five years or more, but we traveled together um, on a number of occasions on clinic yeah. tours and things like that. And, and I just want to say for everybody watching this, what, what you're saying, um, I witnessed this firsthand and I, and, and I knew of your work ethic before this, just from, from working together and all the sessions and all the, yeah. the even back in the, in the late eighties, early nineties, how crazy your schedule was. But I remember us traveling and I don't know if you remember this, Kenny. I bring it up a lot, but you've, you've, there's a lot of water that's gone over the dam since then. Yeah. But, but that clinic tour we did in Mexico where oh, yeah. we were flying to each date with a drum set on the plane. We were getting like no sleep. We were, it, we, you know, we were, we were in our thirties. We were kids, but we were, we were like going till one in the morning, having dinner yeah. with the, the yeah. dealer and the distributor five o'clock the next morning yeah. at the airport schlepping. And on we go. <clears throat> and you were unbelievable. I just remember you never once complained about anything. We'd, we'd get to the couple of times we got to the venue and there was no PA system. And the people yeah. were, I don't think people had cell phones in those days. And then the PA would show up like, 
an hour before we're supposed to yeah. start and yeah. plugging things in. And you're like, you're like, dude, it'll, it'll, we'll just do what we got to do, man. We'll, we'll make it work. Yeah. You know, and yeah. there aren't a lot of guys I can tell you that would have that, but, but that reflects in how positive and, and how it all felt to everybody because they were amazing. These every, so I just want to say that so everybody Thanks. understands yeah. that you do practice what you preach, what you're saying, you, you give out a hundred fold back. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. I'll share one story before I go that's in, in, in that light. And it was right before the pandemic. I'm uh, in, and, and everybody that knows me, uh, they go, what? part of why I, I, I work so much is because I'm so a stickler of detail. So uh, yeah. I make these very, very heavy charts. So I'm flying, I have to learn 34 songs in Russia, a land, I, they've been rehearsing for 10 days. I, I got one night and the next day to rehearse these these tunes and um uh and then they're filming it and they're recording it it's the 50th anniversary and i said make sure you send me the arrangements if they change i'm going to write everything out i'm pr practicing all these parts all the way to russia from uh, uh vegas where i was playing with fogarty i go right from this airport to the kremlin setting up it's all kind of a little bit loose we're rehearsing the next day we got 30 something songs to rehearse before and all the arrangements have changed and I'm there with Marco Mendoza and Marco says to me dude and the, you know I'm 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 a seasoned drummer now and he says I, I know six great drummers who would have walked out of here by now he says yeah. man I admire you for being cool and being keeping your composure and we had a little break and I go back out there and it's like two hours before the show and there's like five songs they haven't even played, which I won't be able to play. And they do a change. I finally go, Jesus, you guys, you told me you were going to. And the, the MD comes up to me and goes, welcome to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Welcome to Russia. <laughs> I'll go, but of course. <laughs> I mean, well, you had to laugh. All right, yeah. All right. listen, Anything I could talk you? to you. I could talk forever, dude. Um, I'll try to call you. Just keep in mind, I'm flying to Logan tomorrow, and I'll be with my yeah. mom Sunday and Monday. We'll be in the same state, and uh, maybe we'll just text each other or something. Everybody okay. out there watching and listening, yeah, thanks for being here, and I hope I inspired you and made you laugh. Oh, you absolutely did, Kenny. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna bug you in the future to do a part two because we got. We, oh we yeah, have, definitely. We only go to part two. We haven't even got. Yeah. Uh, yeah, everybody, as they say in Russia, I'll be back. <laughs> All right. Okay, John. Take care. Oh, love you, Kenny. Thanks, buddy. I'll let I, you jump. I'm going to keep this thing going for one more minute. Okay. Right. Take care. I right, Love you, pal. Safe bye. travels. Yeah, bye. bye. Oh, man. Wow. All right. <laughs> well, everybody, thanks for watching. Jim McGathy, I, I, I wanted to mention to Kenny, I just saw your comment. Um, it's good to see you, Jim. We were talking about you earlier. I guess you texted Kenny when we, we were doing the test. And, and I said, I hope Jim's watching later. So I'm glad you, you're watching. Good to see you, pal. I drive by your street very often now that I live in Cohasset. I go right through Hingham all the time to get onto Route 3. So one of these days, I'm going to come knocking on the door. Um, Neil Porter, jump in with GTA. Yes, I will switch my drums around right-handed for Kenny Aronoff anytime. And I'll bring a change of drum heads because they'll need to be replaced after Kenny plays them. I was going to mention a story. I uh, had a bunch of stories I wanted to mention, but you, you could see Kenny had a lot on his mind. But um, Anton Fig told me this funny story about how uh, when Kenny used to sub for him on the Letterman show back in the in the old days, and uh, which he did a number of times. But I guess on one particular occasion, Anton showed up. I think it was close to the downbeat and realized that that uh, or maybe his tech was changing on all the heads or something. But I think the point of it was that Anton had put on new heads like the day before and then before Kenny came in and played. And then when he came back, they were just destroyed. <laughs> so uh, keeping the folks at Remo busy in those days. All right. Well, I want to um, quickly, I meant to do this uh, at the front end of this show. 
Uh, give a big shout out to my buddy Ryan Smith at Sure Microphones, Sure Brothers, for this really cool dandy new microphone I have. It's called the MV7. Uh, and it's made just for this. The old mic that I had was pretty cool, but this thing is pretty rocking. Uh, so thanks to Ryan and uh, and Quinton over at Sure Microphones and all the folks at Sure. And uh, I'd love to get your feedback on how this thing sounds. Does it sound good? Does it sound not as good as the other mic? I can't tell, obviously, but it seems pretty cool. Um, anyway, but thanks for watching, everybody. We're coming up on just about 90 minutes. I haven't done a long one of these like this in a while now, so... I might need a little cold beverage when I'm done here, if you know what I'm talking about. Neil, good to see you, buddy. I'm excited about tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, uh, my band and Neil's band, Grand Theft Audio, will be doing a live stream, uh, a virtual gig, a gig that you cannot attend, but you can watch us uh, on Zoom. And I think it's going to be shared to the band's Facebook page, to our Grand Theft, Theft Audio Facebook page. But um, I'll put the link up on my the Zoom link on my Facebook page and anybody can watch. Um, I hope you guys tune in. I hope we don't embarrass ourselves too much or at all, but uh, it should be fun. So it'd be just great to play again. And Scott, thanks, buddy. I'm glad it sounds good. Scott Hessler, my old pal. Uh, thanks, Mark. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. I'm glad you love the interviews and I'm glad you're enjoying them. Thank you. I appreciate it. A couple of quick notes here. Uh, if I can read them, I will. Los, good to see you, buddy. Carlos Guzman. All right, Cyril McKinnon, Jim McGathy, there you are again. Jerry Dupree, Bob Terry. All right, all the all the usual folks. Great to see you guys. All right, well, on that note, everybody, um, be safe. Have a great weekend. Don't forget next week, next Friday. I'll be reminding you, of course, will be Steve Gadd at 1 p.m. Eastern time. That's May 21st. Um, please watch that one because Steve's very sensitive to the number of people that that watch these things that he does. And he'll, his feelings will be hurt if uh, if you're not watching. So, <laughs> hey, Dave, David Wasikin, and thanks, buddy. All right. Well, cool, everybody. Thanks again. Um, I'll see you soon. And uh, I'm going to put this up on uh, YouTube in just a little bit. So again, thanks for watching. Yeah, Steve Gadd, that's right. Okay, see you later, guys. Peace.